So there's different applications for different needs. The mite away strip you can use over a period of seven days. So if you need a quick fix, so to speak, in midsummer and you're afraid your varroa problem is more uh, worse than what you want it to be, you can do the mite away strips. Again, no honey flow, but you can take a week, put two strips in each box and treat them real quick. Uh, the Formic Pro is, has options. It actually does 14 day. What's ironic is they're both Formic Acid products and there's just different percentages of strength. One's 46, one's 42. So the application that you need, you know, there's products out there that can accommodate that without just being dependent on one particular product all the time. I'm not positive, but I think the Apigard, which is thymol and an all natural product, is a 30 day application. So do a little homework and see what works best for you and for the time of year that you're in. And let me reiterate, over at the hardware they have the oxalic acid product. If you use oxalic acid, which is a great product, please be follow the specific directions because it's it's actually a wood bleach product so it's an all-natural but it can be invasive if it's overdone okay any questions on the varroa mite before we move along proactive okay let's talk about the other big problem that we're going to have and these folks have a hive that came over winter they opened it up and they found small hive beetles. The hive beetle is a problem. <laughs> Here's what you need to understand about the hive beetle right out of the gate. If your hive is strong and healthy, it can fend off the hive beetle. It can keep them at bay. I've watched hives and I've had strong hives and the hive beetle will try to penetrate into the hive but the bees will they will literally get a hold of that beetle and sting it to death they'll roll with it it's comical to watch they'll actually grab it and they will roll until they sting it and kill it so a strong hive can fend itself defend itself against the small hive beetle the problem is if your hive becomes weak and there's not enough bees and the population of the hive beetle gets too big, they will overtake your hive and they will make a massive mess inside your hive. And you should have pictures in your brochures there to show just how, if you get a frame that's, that's slick looking, glassed over, you've got an issue with hive beetles. They've gotten into the larva, they've gotten into the frame, and you've got a real, really bad problem. So the hive beetle pupates in the soil. Uh, you can take proactive measures, again, with Guard Star and with uh, the nematodes. The nematodes I have found to be really effective and work really good. Uh, they multiply and it seems like once you do the nematodes, it's not something you have to do every year. So it gives a lot of uh, length to application. The thing that you have to be mindful of, the hive beetles do not like the sunlight. Once you open the top on your hive, they'll go to hiding. They'll go to the dark places and they'll get under the corners of your frames. When your frames in the box, they'll sneak under the corners here and they'll hide. If you have frame spacers, they love frame spacers because there's an area back behind this frame spacer that they can get into to hide, okay? But the frame spacer is a necessary element if you want to do nine frames or eight frames in your hive, so you contend with that. The most important thing you can do is keep in your health hive healthy. They can survive and withstand. The other thing is you can do treatments on your hive or to help with that. I lost my thought too, I left it, it left me. Um, <clears throat> ground cover, 
works fine. But a lot of people that will do chat around their hive or they'll do fabric cloth around their hive or they'll just do different methods like that to help prevent and reduce the effectiveness of the population of the small hive beetle. Yes, sir. What is the range like on these things? Because whenever I ordered the nematode, it said it's to treat within like a three foot area around. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, does that really mean that if they come up out of the ground outside of that area, they're probably not going to make it to the hive? Well, the nematodes eat the pupa in the ground. So the nematodes, when you get that little bag of nematodes, there's millions of nematodes in there. The instructions will tell you to mix it with like a five gallon bucket of water. So it expands it. And then you take that and pour that around your three foot area, around your hive area. And they actually, like the di diatomaceous earth, will attack the pupa in the ground. The nematode uh, actually eats the pupa in the ground, in the soil. Totally lost my thought. That's well, terrible. I think what you're asking is, do the hive beetles come from farther away? Yeah, and they will. They will. You, you control them. You're not eradicating. Okay. Yeah, you're help, You're controlling. If I've got a new hive and my bees are coming in May, should I tree just as a precaution? Because I don't know what's in the ground there. I would either a guard star or, and now's a great time to do it because you have no worries about affecting your hive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the hive beetle w doesn't like the sunlight. If your hive is weak, they will penetrate down into the hive and they can't overtake the hive. Uh, there are some things that you can do inside the hive to help that. Uh, the hardware has or any supplier will have little trays like this that you can fill with mineral oil. <clears throat> Some reason or another, they love the mineral oil, and it's kind of comical to watch because the bees will actually drive them to it. You can also use, these are called beetle traps. They set down in between the frames like this, fill it half full of mineral oil. Uh, the reason I use mineral oil instead of a vegetable oil or a cooking oil is the cooking oil will attract what? <coughs> and raccoons and other critters like that. Mineral oil will not. So these, I like the beetle jails is what these are called because you can actually clean them out and reuse them. But them hive beetles will get into that oil and once they're in the oil, it's all over but the crying. It or captivates them. So what you'll find within your hive, the most popular places in the hive is basically at the corners. So they'll work, you'll see more hive beetles predominantly in the corners like this. So that's typically where I usually go initially. And I'll put two per box like that. I'll go to the opposite corner with this other one. Here. You had a question. That was my question because I did have the disposable ones in there. Not one beetle was in there. Okay. What'd you use to catch them with? I had the oil in there. Okay. Mineral oil. But I didn't put them in the pan. Okay. Okay. These, uh, to be honest with you, the beetle traps are a little more challenging because they have a tendency to slide. Uh, because of the design, you can see they're kind of funnel shaped. Um, but the honeybee will actually propolis these down. So once you get them in there, they'll stay. Uh, but these are the throwaway kind. You can't reuse these. So once you've got it full, and they will just fill it half full, just this one half full or a third full. Once the bee, the the beetles get in there, it's over, and you fill it up. The thing you have to do with these is throw them away and buy new ones. These you can take home, clean them out, and reuse them. So whichever one you want to use. And I, again, would encourage you to use the mineral oil product just for the safety of your hive. 
Uh, Checkmite is also a product that's been approved for the control of hive beetles. Okay. Any other questions about the hive beetle? You have to be proactive. You may not, when you open your hive, you may not see a hive beetle initially. What I have found with my strong hives, you remember I told you I use a screen inner cover? I see them a lot on top of the screen. They want down in there, the bees won't let them in there. Once they try to penetrate through that screen, then bees are all over them. It's really a fun circus to kind of watch. But uh, the strong hive is really critical in that. The weak hive is the one that will suffer the most from the infestation of hive beetles. Did you? Did you put oil in a beetle tray? Put oil in. Yeah, and, and you talked about the vegetable oil. I didn't have some one time. I put the vegetable oil in there and it turned rancid. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the hives go through the level and, and I mean, it just, the bees drop them down in there, they never get a chance to get anywhere else. Right. So there is a, what, what Al's talking about, there is a bottom board that actually has a tray where this one has the white board. It actually has a tray that you can put liquids in. That it's about that deep and you can put mineral oil in it and as that hive beetle falls through the, it catches the uh, in the oil and it's over with for that too. That's become a relatively popular bottom board as well over the past few years. I'll tell you something else I found out about that board is when the wax moths try to get in there they'll go down there the bees won't let them work up above yet and when I pull it out to inspect it I can so it helps control that? I think. I mean, you have to pull it out and look at it, but the bees, they go down there where the bees can't get them, I guess, getting ready to come back up. Right. Right. Good. Good. Good to know. Anybody else? Any other questions about the small hive beetle? In this predominant area, the two pests that you will have to deal with and be proactive with is the varroa mite and the small hive beetle. It's just a given. Uh, you, oh, I know where my thoughts just came back to me, hallelujah. <laughs> One of the things that can create you more problems with your hives, if your hive's setting in a lot of shade, what we have noticed and seen that hives that are sitting out in the middle of the sun, the hot sun, are not as affected by the hive beetle as those that are sitting under trees or under tree line, a little more shade cover. They seem to have more infestation with the hive beetle. So when you're placing your hive, bear that in mind. And we talked about that, I think, in the first class or the second class. But just bear in mind that if you're, like I have people that have their hives in the woods, their tendency to deal with hive beetles is going to be a lot stronger. They're going to have to contend with it a lot more. Some reason or another, shed the shade has a bearing. Well, the hive beetle just doesn't like the sunlight. When you take the lid off, they'll run to hide because they don't want the light. Okay? So is that why some people put their hives in the middle of a field? Yes. The commercial producers particularly want their hives out in the middle of the field because they want those bees out working. Um, because the temperature makes a difference on how quick the bees come out of that hive and go to work. So out in the middle of the field, temperature warms up faster, they're out of the hive, they're working, they're more productive, they're bringing more honey stores in, which is what the commercial producer is wanting. Um, me, as a novice beekeeper, I like to just be a little more caring for my hive, so if I can get an afternoon shade, because I like afternoon shade and I don't want to sweat as much, I think they need that too, so here I go. <laughs> But the hives that I've put out in the middle of the open field have done well. The bees will manage to keep it cool as long as there's a water source close by. Okay? Any other questions about the small hive beetle? Let's talk about wax moths. You've got a, in your brochure there, you've got some information on that. These guys are a little trickier. Um, there is a trap that you can hang to help catch them. 
you will predominantly see most of the challenge with them in the fall of the year. Um, and they are a problem. Again, I go back to a healthy hive can defend itself and protect itself against them. A weak hive will easily be overthrown by the wax moth and they will take over that hive and run them bees out. Once they get started in that hive, it's almost a point of no return. Would you agree, Al? Yeah. And I didn't expect my hive for six weeks. When I did, it, yep. And it, it happens fast. So a lot of times when you're looking, you might see a wax moth on the top of your screen board. That's a good alarm clock for you to watch and be protective of it. And again, the important piece of that is how healthy your hive is, how strong they are. That's why I always encourage if you can start with two hives, that way you can monitor the level of strength of the two hives and see how you're doing. Wax moths are a challenge. They really are. And, and they're something that, that you just have to be proactive with in the, winter, in the fall months to make sure that uh, you're on top of it and you see what's going on there. One of the things that will help you in the fall of the year with the wax moth is your entryway. If you can reduce your entryway when the cool weather, when it starts cooling down in October, October seems to be the month that I see the worst effect of the wax moth. If you can put your entry reducer on your hive, that helps your bees have less area to defend and they can have a better chance of defending their hive. Just little things like that can maybe save a hive, okay? Any questions about wax moths? Not that I'm aware of unless you do uh, hang up a trap, like a yellow jacket trap. I mean, you can make uh, moth traps to hang in trees close by that'll help. Don't they have them over here for sale, too? You have moth traps over there? Uh, they may have them on the garden, but they don't have uh, Okay. If it were me, I'd have them off. My we the weather now, and if my hive's in good shape, if I know they're healthy and they're strong, I'd pull it off. The temperature level, what, what have you got on top under your, what kind of inner cover have you got? Right now I have the solid one with the circle, but I do have the, the screen. So with the, change out. With the solid, with the inner circle, I definitely would pull it off because they need more airflow up through there, especially when Monday when we get up to 80, that airflow will be, be good for them. Uh, and I, I would change my screen cover any time now. When it gets warm enough, providing I don't see any threats to my hive, and it gets warm enough temperatures, I pull my reducers off and just give them free rain. Okay. Any other questions? The other critters that you have to deal with, uh, ants can be a problem. Um, ants love to get into hives. Healthy hive can take care of that. Weaker hive, it becomes a problem. Cinnamon is a good all natural product for ants. Sprinkle it on the landing board. The bees do not mind cinnamon at all. Ants hate it. The other thing I can do, and it seems like I might have said this earlier, if I have mine on a rack of any sort and I can put a, an oil or a grease on that rack to make the legs slick, it'll help uh, the ant control as well. If you get ants into your hive and they get started, you will have to do a house cleaning. You'll have to take it frame by frame and, and do your best to clean it. 
Uh, hopefully they never get infested so bad that they're, they've got egg and larva population in there. If that gets that bad, then you really have to take some serious measures to control that. But there's nothing wrong with sprinkling a little cinnamon inside the box as well. It's not going to offend your bees if it becomes to that point that you need to uh, take that directive to control that issue. Okay, uh, Ants are not typically too big a problem, especially if your hive is strong. Wasps and hornets can be a problem in the fall of the year. What happens is they're all fighting for food source because they know winter is coming and wasp and hornets will try to integrate into the hive. I can't stress enough, strong hive can handle it. Weak hive will be challenged and can be overthrown. So it's very important that you uh, be proactive with your hive and they stay as healthy as possible. There are wasp traps, yellow jacket traps that you can put out uh, to help defend that. The bees, it's kind of comical to watch them fight on the landing boards. I mean, the wasp will try to get in even on a strong hive. It's fun to watch. It's kind of a, like a three ring circus, but they always manage to take care of their cell. Any questions? Uh, the biggest thing that I would say that's a threat to a strong hive is the varroa mite because the varroa mite attaches itself to the bee. So you might have 60,000 bees in that, in that hive and you might think they're really strong and they are, but if, if a third of them have got varroa mites attached to them, then you've got a, a challenge that'll have to be. Uh, the other pest that we've talked about Basically, like they can manage control of that because of the strength of the hive, but the varroa mite is kind of a, a merciless product. Anybody else? Um, who all is getting bees this week? Next week. So, um, for the longest time, we handled, and still do it, Nixa hardware. Whenever I was handling the nukes for them, we found that there was a real good method to take care of these nukes and get them home. Go to Dollar General, and they'll run out every year, but go to Dollar General and get you a laundry net. You put that nuke in that laundry net and zip it tight, tie it off. You can actually carry them nukes in the front seat of the car with you without threat. So if you're in an SUV or anything like that, the laundry net is a real good answer. We've had, uh, I've seen people come and pick up bees in uh, one year, a lady in a Cadillac Escalade. SUV product, three children in the back seat. No laundry net. And I'm like, ma'am, you don't want to do this. The only way I got to transport them, I said, no. I said, you go to Dollar General and you get some laundry nets. I'm not putting these kids at risk like this. I said, I'll put them in the nets for you and I'll tie them off. But this is too dangerous for those children in the back seat because they will get out of the nuke box. They'll find a hole, they'll ease out, and you'll have a challenge. So if you're in an enclosed vehicle to haul them, yeah. laundry net's the key, okay? Uh, also, if you're traveling long distance in a pickup, Put, tape them down, put them up against the cab. The airflow is critical, but the airflow will be too strong toward the back of the pickup bed. It could flip your box lid open and then you've got a real problem. So put them up against the cab. They'll get plenty of air and you're protected that way. What, what was that? That's one way to get a swarm going real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the hardware? Yeah, yeah, it's real critical. That it's very important that you take precaution with the bees, and here's why. Bees don't like to be jostled around too much. They've been on a, a flatbed trailer. Uh, they've been in shipment for two days, probably, more than likely. Two years ago, when we got the load in at the hardware, uh, 
It was an inexperienced driver. He had apparently hit his brakes too hard. One of the front two pallets shifted up against the back of his trailer. Those bees were PO'd. <laughs> And it was raining that day. The guy that was on, the guy that Jeremy that was on the forklift, I felt sorry for him. He got eat up. Those bees were mad. They don't like to be handled like that, and especially jolts and sudden bumps and rain. All of those are negatives. So the weather conditions are critical. Let's hope and pray that when you pick up your bees that you've got a warm, sunny day they're not going to want to be handled much anyway but you have to do that so you've got to take safeguard and precaution they'll close up the front of the nuke box uh, they better close up the front of the nuke box for you so this little tab will get closed up just pull it out like that push it in and that locks the box they'll tape you want to tape down the top of this box and as you can see, there's all kinds of ventilation opportunity in this box. They manage to work their way through and find the little crevices and get out. That's why a laundry net in an enclosed vehicle is so critical. But tape this box down. If you're in a pickup and you're going a long distance and you've got three or four of them, I would encourage you even to tie strap the tops down just to make safe and be safe so you'll have bees when they get there. We have had issues and saw issues where a lady come from Arkansas a couple of years ago, got home. She bought three of them, got home. She had two. <laughs> she didn't tie them down in the back of her pickup. The lid flew open and she was out of bees in that particular nuke and then tried to blame us and it was not our fault. Once they get loaded into your vehicle, they're your responsibility. So just know that, okay? Um, and be safe and be wise. When you get your nukes home, you've got your hive stand already set up, hopefully. Take that box, set it on top of your hive, open the front up and let them fly and leave them alone. Let them settle down till the next morning. Then the next morning you can take and put them in your hive box and get along fine with them. Put, the, put it up to allow them to fly. Yep. Now, if you don't, they will really be ticked off. <laughs> they'll, when you open it up, you better have your veil on because they're going to come out of there in a fury anyway. If she should have brood in there, she's not going to leave her brood. Okay? But you'll want them to open them up, let them fly through the evening and overnight, or uh, afternoon and evening, then the next morning. It's the easiest thing in the world to do to put a nuke into a hive. Uh, just take your five middle frames out. I always have my sugar water with me, and every frame that I take out, I mist them down. When I open the lid, I mist it just to calm them down. I take a frame out, I'll mist both sides. I try to pay particularly close attention to my frames. I'd like to see the condition my frames are in. How much brood, how much honey stores, kind of looking how many bees. If you can find your queen, that's okay. If not, I wouldn't take a lot of time looking for her. The main thing is getting them transitioned over. And just as you take the frames out of the nuke box, put them into your hive box. Same order. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't put, you know, you wouldn't want somebody coming in and putting your bathroom furniture in the living room. <laughs> you want to just leave it like it is. The other thing that I do, the other five frames, if I have a 10 frame box, before I, before I ever put my nuke frames in, I'll mist them down with sugar water. So they'll fan out and take to them, okay? But it's an easy transition, just relax and enjoy it. You're gonna have a few bees flurry around you, but the easiest thing, it's much, much easier to deal with nukes than it is packaged bees. And most of them are, are by leaving them overnight and letting them settle down, most of them will be very docile. Okay. And then after you've done that, how long typically until they're all out of the nuke? So what I do is once I get my frames out, you'll still have a few bees in there. I just close up my hive, make sure it's opened up. I put sugar water on a feeder on the front. I use the feeder. You use whatever method you want. And then I lay the nuke box 
on the top. <coughs> ah, don't let me get tight. Like this, and prop this lid up, and just leave it overnight. They'll find the queen. Her pheromone is still in this box, so they'll come to it somewhat. But by nightfall and next morning, this box will be totally empty. What causes the queen to want to leave that new box and go into the hive? Her brood. Okay. So all your frames, she's been there. They're hers. They have overwintered her. More than likely, they should have overwintered that set of bees uh, with that box or at least a hive box. So that's those frames are theirs. Her firm runs all over it. Those bees are used to it. Her brood's there. Her babies are there. She's not going to leave. Typically. Typically. She doesn't read the books we read. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't worry too much about her. Unless she's just a real young, nervous queen, I don't worry too much about her taking flight. Any other questions? I really am done for the day, guys. So another question then. So we've done that. We've transferred them in there. When would you recommend we open up that hive again? I'd give them at least three or four days, maybe a week. I would check every couple of days or every day just to see that I've got the activity coming in and out of there. But if you've taken all those steps with sugar water and all of that, more than likely they're going to stay <clears throat> once in a great while. They won't like where they're at. I've never had one to leave. And then when we first start, we don't have one brood box on at the time? Correct. Okay. Let them fill it out, eight frames minimum, and then go. When you are setting up your hive, uh, I know that it's got to be mostly levels, but I've heard people talk about having to like Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. When you set up your hive, and we're going to talk about this next week, but we'll talk about it today, You'll want a slight tilt forward. The reason for that is when it rains, you do not want water running back into the hive. So I give it, I always take a level, and as long as the bubble stays between the lines, but leaning toward the backside to where I've got elevation behind, I know when it rains, it's going to come off of that board, then that's the proper structure. You don't want too much, but you don't want it flat to where the water could run back in it. That'd be great. That would be great. Yep. And if you're worried about the oil and that pan in the bottom, it has to be level. Remember, it's a screen bottom. The water's not going to stay there. Right. It'll run out. Yep. So, yes, you do want a slight tilt forward. Crossways, you want it level across this direction, but a slight tilt forward to where the water will run off and protect that hive from moisture. Any other questions? Yes. Um, when we put our nook in, if we're going to do those strips, those uh, mite strips, just as a you know mm -hmm. precaution, should we wait that week before uh, let them ha have the hive for a week before we put them in, or should we put them in right away? I'd put them in right then. Right then. Yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to, unless your nuke was just really cranky. Uh, if they're when you open that box, if they're just really fussy and I probably wouldn't agitate them anymore. I mean, the strips won't agitate them, but you being there will agitate them. So I'd make it as quick as possible, come back in a few days and do it. But typically I'd just do it right then. Most of the nukes, and I want to understand this supplier that the hardware's getting, they're really sweet nukes. I mean, as far as nice, gentle, docile bees. Yes, ma'am. So you want to secure them, and the cooler you can keep that vehicle, the calmer you'll keep those bees. Okay, the warmer it is, because you got to remember, they're in this box, and that box is pretty warm, especially if you have an 80-degree day. So crank up the AC unit. That'll keep them calm down and more docile because it's too cool. So in the back, not in the floorboard? Either way, as long as you're in a laundry net, I mean, you can put them in the floorboard or... Front seat with a seat belt, whatever you want to do. But keep them cool. If you need to wear an overcoat, your cold nature, wear your overcoat. Keep the cab cool so they'll stay calmer and more docile in the cooler temperatures. Anybody else?
It's a windy, rainy, crappy day. Probably not a good day to transfer them. Probably not. So it wouldn't hurt them to keep them another day if you had to? As long as it's opened up and they can fly, you're fine. When you say opened up, you mean the little yep. opening, right? The tab. The little tab in front. As long as you've got it open where they can get out, in and out, fly in and out, you can leave them a couple of days. Oh, you don't have to put them in right away. Just leave them on top for a couple of days before you put the frames in? Usually what I do is I take and set that box on the top, open that front tab up so they can fly in and out, so they can get in and out of that nuke box. Then I leave it set overnight so they settle down. The next day I'll go in and transfer them. Now his question was, is it rainy or real windy? Would you wait another day? And my answer would be yes. As long as they can come in and out of that box, they'll be fine there in that box for a couple of days. While you're doing that, while they're sitting up top, do you spray the, uh, the inner um, screens with um, sugar water so that they're enticed to go into the, the new house? Or? When I get ready to transfer them over, then I do my misting because I don't want to attract anything else into my box until I'm ready for my bees to go in there. Yes, ma'am. How heavy are those new boxes? Uh, they'll weigh 55, 50, 55 pounds. They're not bad. See, when you get to the new box, you got to remember, they've been living in this for quite a while. That's a so it's not like they're not always used to doing it. Because sometimes people don't pick up their new boxes. And I'll take them to my house for two or three weeks so people can come back and get them, and they're just fine. Yeah. Yeah, they should be. Most of them are overwintered. The guys that I used to know down in Blyville, they pretty well, they, they split them out in the fall and overwinter in those boxes. Anybody else? Floor's all yours. <laughs> yes. Any chances that there may be um, any, other, um, any other queens other than the one in there? That's a real good, that is a really, really good question. So when I take and transfer my frames, I do look my frames over because once in a while you'll get a real prolific queen and she'll have tons of brood. Four of those frames will be brood. What's the next step? They're out of room. What's going to happen? So you have to really pay attention to what's going on there. That's why I examine. Because I've seen, you'll get, once in a while, you'll get a hold of a box and you'll think it weighs 75 pounds because it's so heavy with bees. That's because you've had a real prolific queen. She's done really good. And that, that nuke is busting at the seams. You may have to tend to that. And you might find a queen cell. If they've been there that long, and this is May, Remember, she starts laying in late February. You very well might could see a queen cell if she's that prolific. So that's why I want to really examine those frames uh, the best that I can to see what I've got going on with this hive. If I don't see any queen cells, then my hope is that they'll go ahead and pan out and my hive will be good and strong. But if I've got queen cells going on, I've got to address that issue. I've got to do something. And more than likely, I'm not going to persuade them otherwise from splitting or swarming. So at that point, you would destroy those queen cells? You can try destroying those queen cells. If you do that, you're going to have to pay particularly close attention to make sure she doesn't lay any more. Because once they get the mindset of swarming, it's really hard to change. So you'll have to watch that. And if you have to create if you're going to split a nuke at this time, this is the time of the year to do it because you've got the summer to go through with it. The other thing I would say to you is give that hive the first year to establish. Do not worry about taking honey from that hive this first year. What is critical is that they're healthy, they're strong, and they're able to overwinter so you have bees next spring. You don't want to go back buying a new set of nukes to replace what you bought last year. So don't worry about honey. Once in a while, you'll get a real prolific queen. Again, a real strong hive. You might get the opportunity to pull a few frames of honey. But by and large, you want to focus on letting that, honey, uh, that hive get established. That's the focus of the first year. 
Yes, ma'am. Does the queen come months already? Not in nukes. Package B is most of the time, yes. Not in nukes. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. some point have like a visual like I've, I've heard the description of what a queen cell looks like versus you know this this over here is pollen this over here is honey nectar brood cells I'm like I'm a visual learner I okay. need to see these things as opposed to just descriptions I mean to me there's one shade of brown one shade of yellow I can't look at it and say well, this one's a little darker than that one so that means this one is that are we going to have that at some point I'll, I'll make sure that I pull a sheet up and have it ready for everybody next next week Great. yep you. you bet how close Oh, out in Ozark, south of Ozark. Ozark has a beekeeper's club, and Nixon does too. If you can get with the beekeeper club, and they'll go out and do a visual on hives, and they can, then you can actually see every bit of that. Gotcha. How do I get, how do I find that? Just go on Facebook and find it, or the yeah. beekeeping club? I give you the number for the, and he can't be, but Nixon beekeeping club, but bees alive. I don't know Ozark. I didn't know Ozark had a club. Yeah, uh, Dan Dory, I know. Now he belongs to the this one here and the one in Springfield. So it's Springfield. Yeah. So Ozark Beekeepers is Springfield and Bees Alive is Nixa. Yeah, that's and uh yes, I can give you the number for Bees Alive Club. And you can go online, Ozark Beekeepers. They have a club. I went on Bees Alive Facebook last night and talked to somebody on in through chat. They will be meeting in person the first Thursday of May mm -hmm. at a church here in town. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I'd, I'd reiterate if you can get into a bee club, rubbing elbows with other beekeepers gives you a wealth of information, helps you a lot to learn, to listen to other people's ideas, to hear what they're doing, how they're doing it. You'll learn a lot of tidbits and and. A, and, and a lot of them have mentors that can help you. If you need somebody to help you, you can call them and say, I don't know what to do. Can you come and help me? And they'll try to find somebody to go out and help you with that. It's really a nice asset to have, um, and it'll help you grow into being able to feel like you're comfortable being a beekeeper. Yes, sir. Is that same process with the nukes as the ones that you catch in the wild? Like you leave them the whole year, let them? Yes, okay. I would. Why don't we do that? Thank you. Catch a swarm? No, no. I, d I don't try to produce honey. Yeah, give them a year to establish themselves without taking production of honey. Yeah. So the last sheet that I gave you was colony collapse disorder. Um, I didn't have all the coffee I should have had this morning, so thank you for reminding me. Colony collapse disorder, there's a, there, it's really kind of hard to define because there's been so much theory revolving around what's causing it. It has been a huge issue in the past five years. I mean, to the point of seeing 30% of the hive population across the United States gone. Those kind of numbers we see for the last five years have been pretty close to the same. I mean, it's just really they're, they're having a hard time pinpointing what is causing colony collapse disorder. There's a lot of theories. There's a, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, thoughts on that in there. You hear everything from microwave transmission, cell phone signal transmission, uh, neonicotoids, a lot of a lot of different thoughts and theories neonicotoids in my opinion may be one of the biggest contributing factors uh, and what that is is a, it's a chemical spray that these farmers use to help the plant product and protect the plant product the chemical itself when they the bees feed on the bloom it causes them to be disoriented and they can't find their way back to the hive so any neonicotoid that you see, like 
uh, and forgive me for saying this, but uh, you can go to major retailers and you'll see on their flowers, they'll identify neonicotinoid, whether it's been treated with neonicotinoid or it's free of neonicotinoid. Let that be a real strong indicator to you. You really don't want that particular chemical in your process of beekeeping. It's pretty detrimental to the bees. Colony collapse disorder is the actual loss of an entire hive. You hear about hives that abscond. You hear about hives that they just disappear. I mean, you'll talk to people that'll say, my hives, they had a hive full of honey and they're just gone. No rhyme, no reason, no understanding what. I don't think colony collapse disorder yet has been clearly defined as to what the is issue is, but it is a problem. And when you look at the sheet there and you read through the sheet, you'll see what kind of devastation it's having on the agricultural economy. So it's uh, something they're gonna have to get a handle on. They're gonna have to figure out what is creating and causing this in a big way, and they're gonna have to do it soon because it's become a real problem. Any questions? Yes. So do they know at that point, as these hives collapse, is there a high mortality then of the bees or are they just so disorganized that they're not, they're not doing the work they're supposed to be doing? They're, the hives, they just abandoned the hive. It's an abandonment type of the hive. But the bees, I mean, do the bees die then typically? That's a good question. That's a good question. If they're disoriented and can't find their way back, then yes, they will probably a loss of bee population. Yes, okay. yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Are we going to learn how to attack bees in the wild? Like, like slow track? Uh, we talked about that last week. Did you miss last week? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll refresh on that a little bit next week. Uh, what I really want to spend most of my time on next week is... Uh, showing you how to work your hive a little bit without bees. I'd like to bring a live hive in here, but I know better. Uh, it would be more fun if they were really here, but we can't. So we'll pretend that we have 60,000 bees and do the best we can with it. But we will go back and revisit that a little bit because we are in the middle of swarming season or it's getting started to in swarming season. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I never understood that. So basically, it it it's kind of market pricing. Um, when I sell honey, I sell it for ten dollars a pint or twenty a quart. That's a pretty average rule of thumb across the marketplace. You can go to places and find it cheaper. You can go to Sam's and find it a lot cheaper. But you need to read the label. Make sure that it's pure honey from US of A. There is a big push and has been for the last few years about how local honey and its effectiveness is for like allergy control and things like that. So buying honey that's raised locally because of the environment you live in, the local honey has more effect for you and does more effective. And I have a lot of customers that buy my honey because of that very reason and they love it and they see results with it. So buying a China honey or buying a honey from way off from here is not gonna have that benefit for you. So you want to make sure of that. You also wanna be sure and note the label because a lot of big producers, and I don't wanna identify any names, they use corn syrup or fructose syrup or additives to stretch the consistency or the, the volume of their honey, which robs you because you want pure, raw, live honey. When I call it raw honey, that means it's not cooked. You do not want honey that's been pasteurized, which means it's been cooked over 95 degrees. It changes the chemical balance of the honey flow. Pure honey that's been strained, that has not been put in an oven or not been treated in any manner like that. That is the best true honey that you can buy. Price-wise, it's a matter of what market. 
some people that call themselves all natural and organic, which is really hard to do based on your geographical location, they'll get premium prices for their honey. Special kinds of honey. If you get into a, a, a you go into southeast Missouri or northern northeast Arkansas, you'll see soybean honey. It's bees that are fed strictly on soybean blooms. I hate the taste of it, but people flock for it. They like it. And there's a Malaluka tree in Alabama and Mississippi in that area, supposed to be the very best honey in the world for its nutrient dense uh, provision. It's premium price too. Now is the, the honey, the sell of it, is that regulated? Is there any, can you call anything honey? Is that basically what some of these people do? Or do you have to label it? If, you're a, if you sell very much honey, I'll bring one of my jars in if you want me to. You should, the, the USD wants you to label it, identify the weight. They ideally want you to put a, a, a label on the back of it showing protein, carb, etc and ingredients. I label the front of mine with my name and pure raw honey, local honey. I don't do the label on the back. If the USD approached me, they'd slap my hand and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're really not that strict with it, but you have to know your source. I mean, it's, it's important that you know your source. Correct. Yeah, like the hardware, when they sell eggs from the farmer, they have to have a license to sell it. There are hoops that you have to jump through to do things like that. But little producers like myself, we don't necessarily have to jump through those hoops. But if you get 35 or 50 hives and you're going to sell honey on a public basis, then yeah, you would have to go through those hoops. Did that answer your question? Pretty much, yeah. Good. Anybody else? Yes. I just want to say the guy asked about swarms. If you go over here at the store, Al, the other Al that works over there, he's got a diagram yeah. that shows you how to build, take one of these boxes and mm -hmm. build your frame and put it in a tree. Mm -hmm. And he says it works. He says he catches about six a year. And he does. He has a swarm trap that he'll give you the, the uh, specs on that you can build out, put it about 12 to 15 foot in the air, bait it with lemongrass oil, and you'll probably be successful with it. Yeah, his, he's done really, really well with that. Yeah. Al sold me some stuff over there that's in a bottle that you spray inside that box instead of just using the lemongrass oil and the cotton ball. Was it Swarm Commander? I think so. Yeah. The name of it. Yeah. That's a commercially produced attractant. The design of that attractant is to replicate the pheromone of a queen, which, Number one, completely replicating, it's an impossibility because every queen's different. But they can get close and they can give that kind of identification. Swarm Commander's been a good product on the market. But and that's it, what he says he uses. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's as effective as lemongrass oil. I'd agree with you. And a big component of Swarm Commander is lemongrass. It, it does have lemongrass oil in it. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Um, is jarring honey anything like jarring like fruits or anything like that? I mean, well, I always say that p putting up honey is finger looking good, plumb up to the elbows. <laughs> it is messy, but it is fun. And you never get, I mean, it's hard work. I'm going to be honest with you. For years before I bought my uh, uh, extractor, I used cheesecloth and strained and cut comb and strained and fill my bottles like that. It's, you usually have to have someone help you because old school, my grandfather done it, my dad done it. We just twist that cheesecloth until that all strained out of that comb. And then we bottle it up. We'd strain it and bottle it up. Worked great, it was fun. And I mean, you'll have it all the way up to your elbows. It's good. Now that you, when you get a little bigger, you can buy a commercial extractor. You cut the caps off of that honey put it in the extractor and spin it out. It does help you in a lot of ways because you can funnel it right into your strainer bucket and then strain it. I always strain mine twice. I have a medium strain screen and then a fine because I want it to get the best effect. And then I bottle it off of that and I've got pure raw honey. But it, 
It's messy. My wife fusses at me. I put garbage bags taped down over the counters and everything. Because you're going to have honey on the floor. You're going to have it on everywhere. But it's good. I like it. So you still have to, so you use, this is, uh, I'm going to pull a sheet of this out, I'll put it back. This is what I use for comb honey. This is an all natural foundation. You can actually bite it off and chew it and eat it. So when I get my frames filled out, I just section it like this and put it in my jars. Then I have to backfill it with my strain honey. So I have a jar full of comb honey. You may, does that make sense? Yeah. So will you put that in the extractor first? Or are you saying you I don't extract it. Okay. I don't extract it. So I don't use any wiring honey. This is an all natural. Yes, I remember you talking about Yeah. This. Okay. So I just, I'll just cut it about an inch and a half in sections and just drop that section in its entirety into the jar. And I usually put three in a quart jar three of those sections and then once I get all of my frames all the comb honey that I want in jars then I have to backfill it with strain honey to fill up the jar okay. got gotcha. you gotcha. you can buy these little trays like this where they just cut it out and set the whole thing like that and don't backfill it but my customers they want the strain around it and it's great cutting off a piece of that block of that comb and pouring over honey big slab of butter and a hot biscuit, baby, you're in tall cotton now. <laughs> How do you get That's them what in I the remember. Frames? <laughs> Say that again? How do you hold them in the frame? So you have to buy a special frame that has the tab at the bottom that you nail back down once you get that in there. Let me try to bring one of them over next week. And, uh, and we might just try to put one together. I was going to say, I think I've got a, I think I've got some at home as well. Well, I'll bring one to show. Who's bringing the biscuits? That's a good question, Joshua. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, no, it's basically a Heinz 57 breed. <laughs> yes, to answer your question. Unless you know where that swarm comes from. Um, case in point, I, I'm a, a fan of New World Cornelian bees. That's the breed I like. Uh, so when my hives swarm, and I catch that swarm, I'm pretty comfortable that that's what I've caught. If I'm out in the wild, I have no clue where that bees come from. It's hard to identify. It's hard to know. Um, let's talk a little bit, just for a minute, let's talk about Africanized bees. How many have heard of Africanized bees? On the news, uh, a couple of years ago, there was an elderly couple that were stung to, get to death by Africanized bees. Uh, same case in point in Colorado, there was uh, an older gentleman, I think it was if I remember right, that was stung to death by a swarm of Africanized bees. Africanized bees, the reason that they have become infiltrated into the southern part of the United States is because back in the 50s, there was a scientist, there was a group of scientists that went to Africa to collect a couple of swarms of these bees to study and try to, they, what their intent was, was to breed them with a more docile Italian type bee to see if they could get them to calm down and become more of a docile, high producing honeybee. The Africanized bee got their name from Africa because what happened over there, the honey badger would actually go in and rob that hive and the honey badger's skin is so thick and tough that that bee could not sting or penetrate it and he would literally destroy that and that, that hive would become so aggressive and so dangerous even though they couldn't ward off the honey badger. 
So when this scientist took these bees to South America, he was trying to integrate them. He had a couple of swarms to escape. And from South America, they have totally been repopulating and navigating to the north, up in through Guatemala, Mexico, and now they're in the southern tier edge of the United States. They are mean as a one-eyed snake. They are very, very aggressive. I mean, if they will pursue you for a quarter of a mile, you know you've got a bad batch of bees, and they will. There's been people, they are lethal. I mean, they if this elderly couple in Arizona got in the path of them unintentionally, they attacked them and stung them to death. They're that bad. They will literally cover you up. We had a guy that lived down by Crane a couple, three years ago that had a hive just like this. And he come to me and he said, Dan, every time I go out there, he said, they just cover me up. And he said, I suit up, I wear protective clothing, I, I undergird that with more protective clothing. And he said, they follow me and chase me all the way to my house. And when I get inside my storm door, they're bouncing off my storm door trying to get to me. He said, I have not been able to work this hive in three years. He said, what am I going to do? I said, take a can of gas and a match. I said, if you cannot work these bees and enjoy it, you have no business with them. You don't need them. And plus, it's dangerous. So Walter Stinson, who was a fellow beekeeper, an Afro-American beekeeper, great guy, love him to death. Jasmine uh, Bass at the Bee Club, that's her father. And he and I were, were working together. I asked him because he lives at Crane if he could go by there and see on this hive because this guy that was telling me this that owned them eh, sometimes you wondered about it if it was embellished you know so I said Walter can you go by and just see what he's got going on there and let's see how we need to do it he said sure I'd be glad to do it so he took his daughter and she had a video camera and they were going to work these bees white suit on he said Dan he said I took the lid off and he said instantly my suit was black. He said, they covered me up. And he said, my daughter, who was dressed out in protective clothing, they covered her up. And he said, all I could do was to tell her, stand still, don't move. He said, it was really, really bad. He said, when we finally, he said, I, I didn't even try to pay, peel out any frames. He said, I put the lid on. He said, I told my wife, or my daughter, I said, let's move gently and let's go to the house he said we get to the back door and we're brushing off these bees and they're pounding on the storm door trying to get to us as we try to walk inside the guy killed the hive he had to those type of bees are not safe nor are they pleasurable to work with typically they're high producing bees but what good is that if you can't get to the honey and work with them so the Africanized bees, I get a little hesitant about when I hear people say, I got my bees out of Texas, I get a little hesitant because those Africanized bees are now integrating with bees in South Texas. So I, I, I just try to take caution there and be wise. Bringing back to that subject, could he have caught one of the bees and sent it in for examination? He could have. Because I would have wanted to know what, what the heck was going on. Yeah. The Africanized bees will be like a black, a little black bee. My grandfather used to call them a midnight bee. And if they got aggressive with him, he took a can of gas and a light match and he just burned the front. He just, he just burned the whole hive. His theory was if I can't work them and enjoy them, what do I need them for? Dan, how many bees do you think would it take to where you get pretty dangerous to kill your way? Well, I've actually, and this is the honest truth, I've actually pulled 56. Yeah, and it, it depends on a lot of factors, your age, your, your, I mean, some people have, their tolerance is not high, some people uh, need EpiPens when they get stung, so it depends on the individual, but I've actually had as many as 56 stings at one time and swell up. It doesn't bother me or affect me like it would somebody else. And this couple was an elderly couple, probably on some medication, so... Saying this 
guys go back all the way to the house and they're still following him. The time means don't go that far. Tip far yeah, typically far. not. I mean, if 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 you have an Italian hive or a, like a New World Canolian or a Russian hive that gets aggressive with you, if you'll just walk away, stay calm, walk away 50 feet, 100 feet, you know, typically they'll leave you. If I can get under a tree branch, that helps me a lot. They don't like to contend with that. So typically, you know, you're not going to have a problem. It depends. Sometimes you'll get a real testy hive. They'll want to just keep coming at you. Just stay calm. The best thing you can do is not panic. If you panic, you just set yourself up for more pain. So just relax. Know that you've got to trust your gear and know that you're okay. If you get a sting or two, it's okay. If you have allergies to stings, if you go to the bee yard, you make sure you have an EpiPen with you. Always. Do not take those risks. Because if they sting you in the throat or in the face and you begin to swell here and it cuts off your air passage, you could be in trouble, especially if you're by yourself. So if you know you have allergies to bees, make sure you have EpiPen with you. Let's be smart about this and not take risk with it, okay? As you get your body changes, I had a friend that gave me my first hive, his brother, they didn't have bees for years. Let me tell how many times he got stung one time. They were going back to the house and he started having trouble breathing. Yeah. And they had to rush him to the hospital and said 20 minutes more he wouldn't have made it. And you just never know. And, and the doc says two years from now you might get stung, might not affect you. And I always carry Benadryl in the glove compartment. Yeah, if you have any concerns about that at all, it's just better to be safe than sorry. I don't, it, it doesn't bother me, or let me rephrase that. Up to this point in my life, it has not bothered me to be stung multiple times. That could change tomorrow. If, the, if a doctor put me on a certain medication, it could change the chemical process of my body, and that might. So all of those things, enjoy your journey, enjoy the adventure, but be wise within it, okay? <coughs> We don't want nobody getting hurt or uh, having liability issues that's unnecessary. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes? On those like African bees and the, the Italian bees, is the only option, like you're saying that they aren't too aggressive to use fire. Um, but like, what if you have like a ton of sugar water? Do you just like spray them like crazy? Or like, <laughs> I mean, you can take, you can try. I was going to say it, you might to get a fire hose or a water hose. <laughs> there, uh, you if you stay in the bee business very long, you will encounter aggressive hives. And that's that's one thing. Aggressive hive is one thing. They're protective. Usually, the more aggressive, the more productive. Africanized bees are beyond the step of aggressive. I mean they're deliberately after you and their intent is to get you. That's a different story. If protecting my hive as a bee is one thing, if I need to be aggressive or I feel like I need to be aggressive to protect it, that's one thing. But if I'm deliberately after that, after you, to hurt you and to put you down, that's a different story. So we don't see a lot of that Africanized stuff up in this neck of the woods yet. Okay, now I've watched where they've uh, black trash bag hives so you don't lose your equipment, just smother them out, and also drowning them out. What are you drowning or smothering? It was both. I've, I've watched them to kill the aggressive bees. hives. Oh, where the they've smothered the hive out and where they've just literally drowned the hive out. I've not saw that with trash bags, so where did they? It was some guy. Was it a swarm? No, it was, it was his hive. They, somebody. He was mentoring or so he that just cut the oxygen hive. off for him. He just cut, cut it off and let it bake, basically, yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Because he said they can, they can survive a while. But then another guy, he just watered them and watered them out. Yeah. Just not to lose the equipment. Yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a lot of options out there to do it. The surest and simplest is a match. But you can do otherwise. <laughs> Little gas and match does wonders. Anybody else? Guys, you've been a great class today. Thank you so much. We'll see you next Saturday. Um, enjoy. <laughs>